Hello, uh, welcome uh, today. I am Mike Day, Dealer Service Representative here at AGWS, uh, and welcome to our July AGWSU F&I Insights webinar. Uh, today, Bob Harkins, our Vice President of Training, will be joined with Ed Stewart, uh, CEO and President of Audible Ready Solutions, um, to discuss uh, conversational selling and being audible ready, uh, value-added F&I sales presentations, and then value-added objection handling. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Bob or Ed, uh, just comment on the panel on the right and we can try to answer those as we go. Or if you have a, uh, you know, any bigger questions, uh, email bharkins at agws.com. And uh, take a look at some of our previous webinars that we've done. If, if you've uh, been to those, um, you'll kind of know how this one will go. And then I'll turn that over to Bob. Very good, Mike. Uh, let's go back to the webinar page again, if you would. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to F&I Insights for the faithful that's been with us on all of these sessions. This is uh, number 23, dating back to 2019. So welcome aboard and welcome back again. Uh, as most of you know by now that our goal for these sessions is to provide you, our agent partners and our dealer clients, really with an on-demand 24-7 uh, F&I and compliance webinar series that you can use uh, yourself uh, to complement your efforts uh, in your stores, either as a training manager or leadership manager or member of our, our, our <clears> team <throat> that's, that's part of our, part of our agent, agent clients. The bottom line, of course, is to help you maximize deal profit, meaning both front-end gross and finance and insurance income, but as always to do it the right way. And the right way, of course, is uh, in a manner that's consistent with good customer relations and sound business practices. As Mike was showing the uh, webinar series flyer, just remind you that uh, if you go to agwsu.com, agwsu.com forward slash webinars, you can uh, you know, scroll through those and, and pick out any uh, of those webinars that you want to view. Just uh, hit the arrow, uh, play the uh, play the tape, see the, the the slides, the PowerPoint, whatever. And if you want any of that information, PowerPoint wise, whatever, just contact me and I'll have marketing send that directly to you. Uh, just uh, had that happen yesterday, really, with respect to an individual. I will tell you. For 2021, the two webinar, web, webinars that seem to have the most play as far as requests for information, when we go back to our April uh, FI Insights uh, webinar, which says when we talked about the ABA, that was not the American Basketball Association, but that was the American Bar Association, the CFPB, the FTC, the NADA, and their impact on the FNI menu, so MENU. So a number of you have requested those slides and that we've, uh, we, we, we've sent them to you. So if any of uh, the rest of you need that or want that, be happy to provide it to you. And then in, in May, the following webinar, just two months ago, I uh, was not able to have Ed join us because of his schedule. But one of the, one of the, the topics that we talked about in May, in addition to FNI technique and the steps of the sale, digital retailing and the FNI process, and also value added objection handling. I also touched on conversational selling and being audible ready. So that, if you joined us in May, really kind of sets you up for, for, for what we're talking about, about today. Let me again reintroduce my good friend, uh, Ed Stewart. Ed is the uh, CEO and president of Audible Ready Solutions. I've had the pleasure, I guess, Ed, and we've worked together for over, over 25 years, almost 30 years absolutely. now. Yes, absolutely. Training, training capacities. So it's great that they had you with us as part of the, uh, as part of, uh, of F&I F &I Insights. Ed, I know that you know that I know the answer to this, but take us back to, your history and background a little bit about how Audible Ready Solutions came into play and just uh, uh, how it's progressing based upon, I think the changes now we have in our industry as a result to the pandemic and also digital retail, digital retailing. And I also noticed that I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at your business card in some time, but Ed, down at the bottom of, of your business card, uh, the top of course says your title and, and Audible Ready Solution. Down at the bottom, it says uh, ready at the line of scrimmage ready at the line of scrimmage. Now, for those of us that follow football, I think we kind of know what you're talking about there, but others uh, may not. So let me just turn to you for a minute to get us started about, you know, what is Audible Ready Solutions? Talk about the line of scrimmage and uh, and, and why this is so important. This Go ahead, Ed. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Bob, and I really uh, appreciate to, this time with you. Um, as you mentioned, um, going back to Audible Ready and the way I came up with that has been a old jock myself and I tried to play a little football um, you know one of the things that we learn is you come out of the huddle with a play unfortunately uh, a lot of times the defense may shift on you well it's the same thing in sales 
uh, when we go out and we, we, you know, come out of our game plan where we've trained and discussed how to go out and present. But a lot of times you walk in and customers may say, you know, hey, I don't want any of that crap you're trying to sell or whatever. We have to become audible ready. We have to make sure we change the play at the line of scrimmage. So line of scrimmage being when you walk up to present to the customer, um, they may switch and they may hit you with something that we weren't planning on, uh, that we should have been planning on, but we, we didn't. And sometimes that could throw you for a loop. So sometimes we could get defensive. Uh, we start presenting the wrong way. Uh, we Customers could tell that, that the only thing we want to do is try to make a sale with them. And that's unfortunate. So we want to make sure we're audible ready and have a game plan uh, when we go out and present to our customers. So in a nutshell, that's basically it. You know, just to remind everybody, sales aren't missed by the dollar amount. Sales are missed because of the, the lack of being audible ready, so to speak. Um, not having a game plan, plan, bad communication to the customer, and we, we tend to miss a lot of business that way. Well, that's great. I, I think you're right on. You know, you know, I've had this conversation before, and uh, uh, my football career was not as great as yours, but back in my, my high school days, back in the 1960s, believe it or not, playing quarterback my junior and senior year, uh, we, uh, we, we called audibles, and being yes. audible ready were things that uh, we, we tried to learn. And, you know, in, in, in my short career of doing that, you know, we used the colors. And the key was yes. you change the color, you change the play. Yeah. So we use black and, and white. So if yeah. I call black 36 in the huddle, went up to the line of scrimmage, called another play, black 45, because I used the same color, it didn't mean anything. Right. But on the other hand, I went up to the line of scrimmage, surveyed the defense. And if I thought in my mind, well, hey, black 36 is not going to get it done, I'm going to switch to white 48. And obviously, hopefully, I was barking those signals out loud enough, and everybody heard, heard that we were off of, uh, of Black 36, and now we're on the, the White 48. I got to tell you, though, a lot of times it didn't come out real well because either <laughs> my signal calling or lack thereof or, or the, the noise or that kind of thing. So it looked like a, like a fire drill in a couple of those plays. And actually, a couple of times I was able to make a pretty good gain out of that, but uh, yeah. also not for a loss a couple of times. And I remember a, I remember a bad fumble, and that was uh, kind of the end of my – audible ready, ready things, but we had a lot, lot of fun with that. Uh, and this slide that we're looking at right now, and you touched on this, conversational selling and, and being audible ready, you know, back in, in, in the early days, even before you and I met, uh, the, the monologue sales presentation, you know, I think that's uh, at least back in the 60s, certainly the 70s and 80s when I got involved, and I was trained for the first time getting into F&I. In 1972, went through a two-week training program in Chicago, and actually, uh, what we were required to do in that two-week two -week training program is is memorize scripts, not only on how to do to, to do the, the the TO or the referral, what to say, but the actual script and presenting credit insurance and just a couple other products at that at that point in time. And really, the customer wasn't saying anything until we almost kind of kind of let it, let them talk. So I remember having to go back to. Uh, two-week training in the hotel and rehearse and practice at night and come back and go on videotape a total of four times in two weeks being graded on every one of those presentations that's you know it's, it's kind of how we did that did things through the 70s and really almost a good part of the, the first uh, first half of the 80s and then you know the monologue switched to, to dialogue because you know monologue was the long speech to presentation by one person like i'm doing kind of now there was no interaction and uh, the CSI scores began to just uh, uh, become terrible. So, hey, the great news is we switched to dialogue, uh, discussion between two or more people. Uh, we got involved with uh, putting all of our presentations together with respect to uh, the steps to the sale being the four areas of number one, qualify, number two, need awareness, number three, need satisfaction, and number four, the trial closed. But you know, we got so cute with that, with dialogue sales, and really converting that 25 or 30 page script into numerous, numerous questions for a lot of people, it, it became an, an interrogation and the interrogation was bad. It became too businesslike. It was too formal. And that led to a combative conversation. So when it leads to combative conversation, you know, no matter how good your products and services are or the reputation of your dealership, it's probably not going to happen as, that, as, as it affects your product sold per retail sale or product sold per consumer lease. So I think just a, a natural evolutionary process, the uh, conversational selling kind of came in, 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 in its, into its own. And not everybody, as you know, is able to pull this off, just like you were talking about with being audible ready. Conversational selling, what we want there is a, as an informal exchange of ideas and, and really 
to ask the relevant questions to get the customer involved because we're a good listener. And rather than making a presentation, be able to respond to their requests for information for information as well. Would you add anything to that, Ed? Well, just to, to tag on what you were saying, the conversational selling basically keeps the customer engaged. Um, you know, um, when I came along and I remember the first time I met you, I came through your F and I school uh, back then and um, you were introducing dialogue selling to us and it made all the sense in the world. But conversational selling, uh, it keeps the customer engaged. They're participating. And, you know, it's just like in any type of sales. Most of the time, the consumers, they're only they only really care about 20 percent of what we're talking about. So if we're just doing a monologue, we're talking about 80 percent of the things a lot of times they could care less about. But if we can stay focused on that 20% that engages and, 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 and brings them into the conversation, um, they're focused all the way through. And it just gives us a better opportunity to earn their business. Yeah, and really, when you think about it, it's eliminating that time issue with time processes. And, you know, with digital sales now or retail and, and COVID, that's kind of changed the flow a bit. But prior to that, I was just talking with someone the other day about the uh, year before last, the JD Power numbers on on how long it takes to sell a new car and, and get through the F&I process. And their number was 187 minutes. So just north of three hours yes. on the new car side. You know, some are less than that, obviously, that's the average, some are a lot more. But among that 187 minutes, 32 minutes of it was downtime waiting to get into F&I. Yeah. So now the question is, what's the customer doing during those that 32 minutes? And then the average number or the average time spent in F&I was, uh, was 41 minutes. So, yeah. but uh, now with so much of it being done up front before they get to the store, we have an opportunity to change, to change that a bit. So again, uh, conversational selling and formal exchange of ideas and the ability to respond to the customer's requests for, for information and obviously being a good listener when we're, when we're doing that. Michael, next slide, please. Uh, F&I techniques steps to a sale, as, as an example, this is not meant to be uh, necessarily a recommendation of, uh, of how you would do this in any store. This is, this is actually from an actual large, very large dealership group that's used these nine F&I techniques steps to a sale for, for a number of years. And I asked Ed if you if, if would com comment on this, and you talked about the changes now to being audible ready, being a good listener, and, 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 and really having to adapt uh, and, and, and listen to what the customer is saying and, and really kind of just not fall into the trap of, of, of just uh, forcing this linear nine steps to the sale, but be able to uh, you know, change it and go to a different step or response, whatever, based upon what the customer is, is saying or asking. Uh, you want to comment on that or any of these steps? Yeah, yeah. well, you know, it's funny because um, these, these are relatively the best practices uh, that we have. You know, and so we want to make sure we come out with this game plan. But as we go out, uh, when we talk about being audible ready uh, for the customer, uh, we should anticipate the events to come. Uh, there are certain things that customers are going to say when we first get started. Sometimes they're going to tell you, hey, don't try to sell me any of that crap or I'm going to leave. Or sometimes they'll tell you, you know, hey, I know your manufacturer makes a great uh, vehicle. Why do I need that? Or I bought one before and never had to use it. So when we know those things are going to come up, we should be prepared for it. And unfortunately, a lot of times we go out and we're not. We, uh, we get caught basically with our pants down and uh, we stumble. So, um, yeah, I know that, you know, I should be set up and I should have a quality endorsement. Sometimes we don't get that. So you have to be audible ready that way also. Uh, we want to make sure that we check the figures. Sometimes we check the figures and the customer says, hey, I never agreed to that. You got to be audible ready at that point as well. So we just want to make sure that we're prepared so we don't miss a step. We don't miss um, the opportunity to bring it back to the, the best practices that you have in front of us right now. You're exactly right. I know we talked about this before. We did a lot of training on Zig Ziglar things over the years and, and Zig's uh, seven Ps and, and our good friend, Jim Abandante, the, yes. what, the, the prior proper preparation prevents pitiful poor, poor, poor performance. Uh, same right. with these nine steps. So if we tie this into to play the COVID pandemic and, and digital retailing and what that's done uh, from a change standpoint for F&I uh, sales and the F&I sales process. Uh, if, you, you, if you comment on that, and the reason why I bring that up is that uh, you know the, the point of sale, if uh, with digital retailing and doing so much either online or on the phone, whatever, and not the entire three or four hour process in, 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 in person, the, the point of sale is much more fluid. 
And as you mentioned to that earlier, that circumstances can certainly change rapidly and easily. And as a result of that, uh, F&I considerations or F&I presentation have really moved further upstream in the buying process. And, and, and I think you would agree with that and the fact that we now must change the, the way that we approach the, the performance in, in a store. Talking to someone recently about eliminating the, the F&I process and they were planning to do that. And a number of stores have done that, including a major a public company and going with some sort of uh, finance and insurance managers and salespeople or sales managers. And you know who, who I'm referring to, they call them VOMS, B-O-M-S. So it's the, it's the variable operations manager. And the variable, variable operations manager is cross-trained to sell, sell the vehicles, but also the F&I products as well. So it eliminates that, that TO or referral to that, that second or third, third, third person. So with that in mind, and I think about this with Audible Ready, and I think this is great as far as what we can do with numbers. You know, customers are now showing up at the store and, and not all the time, but, but many times their sale and financing is nearly, is nearly complete. I mean, yes. they know the numbers, uh, they, they know the, 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 the trade value, they know the amount financed, depending upon our flow of presentation and their questions uh, during that, that process before they come into the store. We may have made a presentation of all of or, or a part of our unique financial package. Maybe they've said yes or no to things, whatever, but we have, we, we have those answers uh, before we start talking to the customer, customer in the store. So if the, if the financing and sale is nearly complete, I mean, in a lot of places, now think about this, if, if this is the variable operations manager with no TO at all, but you, you expect the vehicle with them, with the customer, they, they inspect it, it's clean, it's gassed up, it's ready to drive, the paperwork is printed and ready to sign, and now we have a quick conversation, whether we're the FLI manager or the variable operations manager, and within maybe 10, 12, 15 minutes, we're into presenting our unique financial package, which is referred to as our optional voluntary protection products, as opposed to the, the, the normal linear presentation uh, pre-COVID, pre-the pandemic, and, and pre-digital retail, where we really don't uh, talk to the customer until whatever it is, two, three, or four hours, and uh, that they've been through that ringer, and, and now we have the opportunity for them to feel much less combative than the, when we when we were meeting them at the end of that that three or four hour sales process. So I think if we buy into that, and if our and if our training is right, commitment, the opportunity really abounds in this new new new, new, new landscape. But only if uh, our dealerships understand that and 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 their potential performance opportunity. But I mean, do you agree with that, Ed? Or what would you add to that? And and how would the, how, how would that relate to the? <laughs> These well, steps of the you know, and, and it's definitely uh, on the rise and something that we're dealing with more and more. Uh, but a couple of things have to fall in place. And, you know, I think where we get a chance to slow it down and control the situation, we definitely can't control people, but we have to control the situation is when we're going through just to make sure that every check all information, make sure everything's correct. That gives us a chance to identify the, the, the driving needs of that, that individual. So we have to slow it down there, uh, review the buying order, the buyer's order, make sure that we're protecting them and present it that way. Um, and then as we get ready to perform, we wanna make sure that we go down to number seven that you have there and that's the, uh, the base statement. Tell them a little bit about who we are. You know, and, and it's funny because Sometimes people will start off feeling like, well, I could care less about any of that. I just want to get this signed and get out of here. But if we really uh, share some information, how long we've been in business and that the fact that we care not only about your business today, but the, down the road as well. And, you know, Mr. Dealer has provided a unique financial uh, package or option for you um, that, quite frankly, is voluntary. Uh, it's not a requirement to do business with us. We just want to set the stage when you were things and you control the situation that way, uh, people will tend to listen and give you the opportunity to go back to some of the basic things and get back on track on some of the things that we're missing under those circumstances. Yeah, and I still think that, uh, again, even though the customer may not say it outwardly, and I, I present this in a number of our, of our, of our um, insights presentations and also in stores, the three questions on the mind of every customer that they, that they never ask outwardly what they're thinking about inwardly. And number right. one, of course, is can I, can I trust you? Right. Can I trust you? Number two is, are you credible? And number three is, uh, do, do you care? I mean, do you really care about me or are you just trying to, just trying to sell me something? And uh, you know, they're, they're not saying that outwardly, but I think that they're certainly thinking that, that, that inwardly. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
I don't know if any uh, one out there listens to a TED Talk, but um, I ran up on a guy a number of years ago by the name of Simon Sinek. And mm-hmm. Simon uh, talks about your why, which is basically, you know, your beliefs. Uh, that goes back to um, your base statement, your dealer value story, um, you know, and who you are and your beliefs. And when you start talking about what you believe in, you know, as he, as he says, the people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so when you show people that you really care, then they'll buy into you all day long. But if you just go in and you're, you're transactional um, focus and you're just caring about today and today only, people feel that. But if you show them that you're about building a relationship with them, a long-term relationship, and you're looking at the big picture, uh, they'll certainly buy into that. And that's why there's a lot of great organizations that will have you know, 60, 70, 80% of repeating referral business coming back to them. And then you have some individuals out there, some groups that they only do business today and ultimately they fall. Yeah, they, they, they never come back. I mean, I mean, right. I mean, that's great. I mean, we care, we really do. We, we, we do things a bit differently here at Harkins Honda. We care not just about your business today. That's very important to us, but folks, play. we care about gaining your respect and earning your, your repeat and referral business uh, for, uh, for the future as well. And I know you get into stores around the country and uh, Let's just say the past year, six months, however you want to break it down. Uh, how, how have you seen uh, your stores grasping the need either for, you know, whether it's directly audible ready sales, but how are they grasping this, this process change because of digital retail or, or, or the pandemic? Can you comment on that? Well, you know, we just had to uh, recognize it, number one, and uh, not be in denial about it uh, and develop a game plan. So how can we, you know, uh, control this, that situation? You know, as I mentioned before, we can't control people. We have to control the situation. I respect uh, uh, the digital sales, but we want to make sure that we figure out how to control it. And it's just kind of what I just said a second ago, uh, finding a way to slow it down just a second, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the timeline, you know, if you look at the timeline, the timeline yeah. is what it's going to be anyway, but yeah. it depends on how you're going to break that down. Are you going to spend a small amount of that time building value and, 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 and trying to sell and the rest of the time trying to close, or are you going to spend more time up front? It's the same amount of time uh, building value and then less time to close the deal. You know, so are you, you talk about are that. Any stores, if any, that are doing a, a good job or above average uh, with uh, the internet sale directly or by phone, or is it, are they not doing that at all and trying to do it all when they come in, or is it just a combination of that based upon based upon the customer? And also, do you have any stores that uh, that that actually have variable operations managers, or is it still the traditional salesperson and then turn to F and I? Well, there's there's a small percentage that'll have the variable operations, but the majority of them are still um, old school, and you know, quite frankly. Um, they've had to make that adjustment. Um, you know, when you have someone come online or phone call or whatever, you know, I think that it's all about the uh, communication and being audible ready. When someone calls on a particular car, they want to know how much, you know, what the APR is going to be, you know, how much or my payment's going to be. They want to know the whole deal. Well, first, we need to make sure that we're on the right car. And we want to make sure that we slow it down just a little bit and find out if, if that's the type of vehicle they're looking for, or is that the budget? Open it up, because a lot of times we get stuck on a car, you know, a particular car. And, you know, once they come in, we find out that we're way off on payments and everything else. So we want to make sure that we slow it down a little bit and just get back to some of the basics. I mean, I know that we're in the digital world right now, but it doesn't mean that some of those basic things that we did years ago that apply today. They still apply. That's never going to change. And what changes the in and outs is our, well, like our, 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 our uh, just the, uh, the lot and, and what we have from the standpoint of, uh, of new cars that, that, that are available. And Absolutely. How we're selling whatever the ratio is, uh, you know, used to uh, pre-owned to, to, to new is certainly uh, much greater just because of, uh, uh, of not having the, uh, right. uh, having the cars. But right. also, I think with the amount of finance going up considerably, uh, whether it be a pre-owned or, or new, term is still there at 72 or 84. Yes. But when you think about that when, when you have products and you have negative equity going in, uh, can, you, can you address you know, when's that, when's that going to hit? Well, you know, we've been talking about that. Uh, so far, I've just got to commend everybody on what we've done so far um, this year. You know, we got hit early in the year with a uh, shortage of inventory. 
and everybody's done a phenomenal job. I mean, we came out of 2020, and I think that as a whole, everybody maximized each uh, deal opportunity. And one of the things that uh, that I want to remind everybody is this is something that we have to continue to do. We, we worked the game plan. We worked and executed the game plan well. Um, the, the biggest fear is when we get back to normal and we have a lot of times at bat, I think that's when we fall short on doing the basics that we're supposed to do each and every time. So I think the focus has been greater. We just have to continue that focus uh, when we get back to the, to the, to the normal, I guess, whatever normal is going to be going forward. Uh, but as far as answering your question about the, um, the negative equity, uh, we're going to really have to develop a game plan there because going into this, uh, to the pandemic, I know that, uh, you know, the average, um, the average negative equity was $5,195. So that was already with the, you know, people bringing in uh, things added to the, the actual sale and the negative equity. So going forward, uh, we're going to have to really develop a game plan on how we're going to handle that. Um, hopefully some of the, uh, the manufacturers will help us um, produce opportunities there as well to uh, incentivize people to come in and, and get out of these cars that they're purchasing now. Yeah, I just did a quick number on that. Even at zero APR, if it was 5,000, I think I divided that by 72 months. That adds another $69 to the payment. Just yeah. right there. Yeah. So and that was then that actually, that uh, quote that I just made came from Edmonds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. And with the inventory that, that, that we spoke of, I remember earlier this year, the uh, NADA's chief economist, after the first quarter and getting into the second one, they had, they had bumped these numbers up from a forecast standpoint for 2021 to be, to be really right at but just under 17 million new cars yeah. and light trucks. So what, so what a bounce back that is from, from last year. Now yeah. with the semiconductor shortage, it's kind of, kind of speaking, speaking for itself. Yeah. Uh, Ed, let me ask you a question, and I know it's going to vary by store with respect to... Uh, uh, their 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 uh, 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 person who handles compliance for them, a compliance officer, lost my train of thought, compliance officer, or maybe they talk with their attorney, which is maybe even a better idea. But with, with, with respect to, to credit applications and thorough review, now we've got that there at step number five, and that doesn't matter. But uh, on a percentage basis, you're still seeing a lot of stores uh, that where the salespeople or F&I are taking the credit application or is most, mostly it's, it's being done by sales or just uh, how, would you, how would you relate to that? Well, I still see a lot of stores doing it by sales, uh, the sales uh, team member. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the next step that, that, that I'm hearing about is, you know, uh, to let the consumer actually complete it. I know years ago um, we did it in F&I and it really increased everything. But from a time standpoint, a lot of people went back to allowing the sales consultant to go out and at least get you know, the first five lines or whatever the case may be uh, to provide the information to pull the credit and get the customer to authorize that. And from a compliance and ethics standpoint and what many attorneys are saying now, and some that are involved you know, in our industry that uh, you know, best practices is maybe you let the customer do it. Uh, everything yeah. is- I can the- see that being a benefit. Yeah, now for, for, for obvious reasons, but, but you're right. When we had that control in financial insurance, at least the, you know, the, the, the credit applications were legible. Now yes. we're doing it, whatever, depending upon how they print or write, then it's right. almost got to start over ag- again. And, you know, you just, uh, it, 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 it's not a good deal. So that comes back to bite you from a time, from a time standpoint, standpoint as well. Uh, good stuff, Ed. I, I appreciate that. Uh, next slide, Mike. Uh, IBS and IBQ, IBS stands for Impact Benefit Statements, IBQ, uh, in, Impact Benefit uh, Questions. I know, Ed, and some of the things that you and I have done together over the years, even when it was uh, dialogue selling, we got into individual benefit selling. And, you know, that was the four steps of qualify, need awareness, need satisfaction, and, and trial close. So we can, you know, we, we probably quote all those presentations for all the products based upon that. Qualifying question, you know, does it apply? Uh, how many miles a year do you drive? How long do you plan to keep your new car? That kind of stuff. Need awareness with the, in part, the timeline illustration. You're going to have this area of exposure or miles at risk. Where you're going to be 100% risk responsible. Uh, who then will have to pay the cost of any major minor repairs after that manufacturer's limited warranties expire? So part of that from a service contract, contract that was the why. And for any product, the need awareness is the why. Why your product, why your service, why your sales idea is important. So qualified need awareness was always 
you know, asking questions and doing illustrations, preferably on paper in front of the customer, needs satisfaction was how you solve the problem. And that was hopefully not just a, a period at the end of the statement, but if you solve the problem that was created in the mind of the customer with data awareness, it was now an, an exclamation point. And then the, the trial closed is just the measure's value. Can you see how our service agreement really gives you a hedge against inflation on, on the cost of parts and labor? One of the things that, 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 I, that, that I transitioned to and, and still present that in stores, what we found in a lot of our dealerships and a lot of stores around the country that I work with uh, from a 20 group standpoint, whatever, had, 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 had done this model and it shortened the presentation. And what that does is for each product, they develop an impact benefit statement or statements. So you obviously tell the, the customer what the product is. It's a vehicle service agreement. It's, it's guaranteed asset protection. It's a gap attendant, uh, attendant contract. And then for each product, as you go through the menu, uh, or if you're not using a menu, it would, would be verbally, but if it's on the menu, what this does for you, the individual product uh, with the key on does, and then what that means to you. And, and, and instead of, the, instead of the, uh, the, the, the longer presentation and the illustrations, uh, like for a service agreement, what we know that works pretty well, folks, the vehicle service agreement, that's what it is. What it does for you folks, you'll be happy to know, is that it gives you a hedge against inflation. A hedge against inflation on the cost of computers, components, parts, and labor, as it provides you with extended coverage for major and minor repairs and replacements at, at a very reasonable cost. I mean, and that, 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 that's, that's what it does. What that means to you, of course, is the great news is you won't have to budget your cash. You won't have to budget your cash for costly repair bill repair bills later. I mean, think about it, folks. What can be what can be better than that? And then, depending on, upon what they say or don't say, we now get into giving the customer uh, not a brochure or not a laminate, but handing them handing them the actual product contract. Example, Mr. Customer, here's your vehicle service agreement for your for your review. Take your time with it. I'll certainly be happy to answer or address any questions you might have. And as you can see, uh, we have the uh, we'll sign the coverages, the exclusions, uh, the maintenance requirements, and limits of liability on pages two, three, four, and five. And you hand it to the customer. Same thing with, with, with GAP, Mr. Customer. Uh, guaranteed asset protection. Our GAP addendum contract. That's what it is. But what it does, you'll be happy to know. It protects your budget, your credit your savings and your total investment against financial loss. What that means is folks, when you think about it, if your vehicle gets stolen and not recovered or, or totaled in an accident, the good news is you may not have to pay. You may not have to pay the difference between what your insurance check is and, and what you owe the bank. When you think about it, what can be better than that? Folks, for your re review, here's a, a copy of our, our GAP addendum contract. Take your time with it. Be happy to, uh, to go over that with you or to answer any questions you might have. But folks, you'll find the, the coverages, the exclusions, and, and the notification of loss procedures on pages one, one, two, and three. Take your time with that and you hand it to them. Much in the same way, we do give before show as you do the, uh, the retail installment sale contract. Ed, have you, have you played with, with that uh, approach at all? Or how did that sound to you? Well, you know, I think that is amazing. And I, you know, we want to continue to grow. And I picked that up from you recently. You and I, we met and we talked and you shared that with me. And I've been uh, implementing that with a lot of my, uh, with a lot of my uh, groups out there. I just think that's awesome because um, I think just receiving information a lot of times when we have a customer that's sitting in front of us and we're upset, I mean, the customer's upset about uh, the way things are presented and they had a misunderstanding. When you give them the contract and let them review it and, and you share it with them, but they get a chance to see it in black and white, I think it eliminates a lot of those problems. So, and I think that we're going to get better as well when we present it that way and we allow them to uh, look it over. That's going to make us better as well as uh uh, financial services managers. Yeah, but for, for, for so many of these things, the coverages, the exclusions, the maintenance responsibilities, the requirements, the limits of liability, if there's an issue later of I didn't know this, I didn't know that, you didn't tell me this, you didn't tell me that, uh, that may be true because all we gave them was a brochure, which is totally incomplete, or a laminate that looks like some kind of a, of a cartoon with the uh, drawings and prices and, and, right. and, and, and parts of the vehicle all over the thing. But it's just that, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, we got to work smarter, not harder. We got to work smarter, not harder. And this approach, what really got me to buy into it was what I saw from the field uh, with a lot of stores, a lot of dealerships, a lot of other instructors around the country had already uh, made this change. And, and I did this several years ago and it's made a big difference for the stores that will give it a try. CSI is higher. 
that the time with the customer is it, 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 it's shorter. And uh, again, it, it's a transparency thing and uh, you're giving that to the customer and, and they have a choice of, uh, uh, of what to do. But it, it, it's changed that, that, overall, that, that, that overall presentation considerably. But I think, again, transparency is the key. Real quickly, the impact benefit questions. Uh, you know, the seminar that I went to with, with a sales psychologist at, um, at, at a conference we did, I guess, three years ago now, was in, uh, was in Florida. And what uh, the two people were saying is that the, the two key words, the most powerful words, are the words one and describe, the words one and describe. So if you can ask questions with the words one and describe with them, chances are you have a greater uh, opportunity to get the customer more involved. So if they're more involved, it becomes that, 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 that conversational selling Absolutely. responding hopefully to their request for information. But here's the ones that we came up with that I've been uh, pre presenting for some time. Uh, on a service contract for sure. Uh, what is the one technology? Well, you might change it. Folks, what's the one or two technology features? Uh, it's not a script. What's the one technology feature that excites you the most on your, your new vehicle today? Uh, let them talk and talk about you know, what JD Power and other people have to say about the need uh, uh, for service agreements with respect to technology and, and the cost of, of not just repairs, but replacements. And the fact that if you're showing tapes of products, you're, you're seeing uh, service uh, managers and and, 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 and and consultants saying, hey, you know, we seldom repair anything really anymore. We have to replace the entire com uh, component. So what's the one or two technology features that excites you the most on your new vehicle? How would, you how would you describe a typical month with your vehicle? How would you describe a typical weekend for you and your family? See how that's different than the old days of how many miles a year do you drive? How long do you plan to keep your new car? Uh, is there a chance your driving habits might change due to a, a whatever a, a job change or another son or daughter is going to be driving this car before you before you sell it back to us? Uh, and, and, and it really it really struck home with me that it's more one on one with the customer and ties in with can I trust you? Are you credible and do you care? And then for the other products, the other products, whether it be dent and ding, a windshield, abrasions, whatever. Uh, it could be the service contract, it could be gap, could be prepaid maintenance. Folks, let me ask you, what one word, what one word would best describe how you felt when? Then after, after the when, you verbalize the story or situation. And there's all kinds of examples. You're driving down the road, you hit that pothole, you hit the sound, you hear the thump, whatever, or you're able to get off to the side, whatever, you get out and look at it, and those low profile tires, tires, guess what? The pothole was probably three times deeper than the size of the low profile tire. Now I got a real, real problem. What one word would best describe? Describe how you thought that happened. Or I came out of the grocery store. I came out of uh, Walmart. I came out of uh, uh, whatever. As, as I got closer to my car, I, I, I noticed that shopping cart uh, was not only near the, the driver's side door, but it was uh, touching. As I got closer, I noticed there was something there, and that uh, that scratch or ding, whatever, uh, was not that was not a good feeling. What one word would best describe how you felt? So we verbalize the story or situation, get the customer involved. And I think uh, most importantly, if they have an emotional attachment, if they have, a, have an emotional attachment to the product that we're selling, then, then that becomes uh, how they really feel the best about the need for that, for that product as well. Uh, what do you think about that, Ed? How did, how did that sound? I think, it's, I think it's great. And you know, the, the, I think the biggest thing about it is it allows us to listen to what the customer, what the consumer is saying, and then also, come back with those powerful words that you taught me years ago. And those powerful words are, hey, earlier you told me or you mentioned or you said, ah, and okay. then we can take that back into it, you know, because they told me. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. So IBS's impact benefit statements, uh, IBQs, impact benefit questions, get the customer involved. And obviously we're always looking for the opportunity to be audible, audible ready. But the point is, it's not a monologue. It's, uh, it's not one way communication. It's two way and not just dialogue, but it's uh, it leads to conversational selling. Uh, next slide, Michael. Ah, value added objection handling. Uh, the, here's just eight uh, objection handling sales ideas, sales techniques, whatever. 99.9% .9 trouble free days of ownership, 99% trouble free uh, percent of covered components, comp collision insurance versus vehicle service contracts extended service agreement at a major retailer versus a dealership VSC, the difference between those two programs, the investment gamble, which I think is a great one, uh, the question mark close, VSC, the why wait gamble, uh, gas savings, and, 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 and your new car payment. And would you touch on, on, on any of those, just to, on again, how that ties in 
to uh, being a good listener and the opportunity to be to be audible to be audible. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, once again learned this from you years and many many years ago uh, on the, uh, <laughs> the 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 days of ownership and one uh, of my favorites because. Um, it overcomes so many different things. And if you're really going to be audible ready, uh, this gives you the opportunity and it gives you the, uh, the sales psychology to make it all make sense. So when you talk to a customer and they say, hey, you know what, you know, I don't really need one of those. I know your manufacturer makes a great, uh, great vehicle. And, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. But let me ask you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, you know, um, if, if the vehicle operated over the next five years, you told me you're going to keep the vehicle for the next five years operated uh, 90% of the time, you feel good about it, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, but heck, let's make it 99.9% .9 of the time. And then you walk them through, you know, and, and there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, that's, then I see this effect of sometimes some, some sales, uh, financial sales managers will give the customer a calculator or get them to get their phone out and let them do the math. We already know what the numbers are gonna be, but when we paint the picture of that 0.1%, what that really means uh, to the consumer and how much based on your labor rates and parts and all of those different things, uh, the light comes on. If I get an attorney in a court of law, you, in most cases, you want to you want to really think that you know or know that you know the answer before you ask the question, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we're involved. Now, look at these and one that, that I see for them, and I saw this done just the other day and doing some things in, 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 in New Jersey. And overhearing a portion of, of the investment gamble that made me feel feel pretty good from a lady that I had in class a, a number of years ago, who's now really a, a top salesperson, but she was was kind of talking about, about about that. But that investment gamble gamble, I think, really gets to the heart of the issue, which most of the time, you know, that question or objection is going to be cost or, or or financial related anyhow. And so, I mean, why not meet it head on? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why not head on? And, 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 and if their payment's four fifty a month without any part of your unique financial package, you know, take that and divide it by 30 days and remind them that that's $15 a day that, uh, that, that they're paying from a transportation standpoint that's providing them with those, uh, with those six dominant mo buy modes, remember, from financial yeah. training class, the safety, the performance, the appearance, the comfort, the economy, and, and, and dependability. Ability, yeah. Uh, yeah, now I can transition to that. Folks, with that in mind, with that in mind, let's say that our unique financial package is adding another $75 a month. Well, 75 divided by 30, that's 250 a day. Well, folks, with that in mind, doesn't it make sense then if you can to invest just, just 250 a day to protect what? And I think there's five major things. And, and, and this is not talking about, you know, engine transmission, front wheel drive, front suspension, whatever. To me, that's not why, and I think statistics tell you, that's not why they buy the service contract. And why they buy the buy the products? They they buy the products because of these five things that your unique financial package uh, can protect for you. Number one is your family budget. Number one is your family budget. Number two is your good credit, your credit track record. Number three, of course, is your increasing investment in your purchase. And what would that be? Customer gave you any cash down payment today? That's an upfront investment. Every now and then you might see a deal, uh, Ed, and free and far between, perhaps, where you have positive trade equity already. So if you see any of that, that's an investment that they've already made. But even if you don't have any positive equity, even if you don't have any cash down today, you know, beginning in 30 or 45 days from the now, from now, and every month thereafter, as you make that payment to the, finan to, the, to the financial institution, what's really happening to your investment in cash? And every customer will get that right. They're going to see that it goes up each and every month, right. whether 450, 450, 450, whatever. So it's your, it's your increasing investment. How about your personal savings? Okay. Having to dip into that, that really ties into the, the other one, the, the, the question mark close. Folks, what would happen to your payment of 450 if your vehicle was in need of repair? I mean, it's not going to stay the same or go down. It's going to go up. Average cost of repair, maybe show that based upon your store or give an example from AAA, whatever. One most recently where they had an article that said AAA, that uh, one third of the American drivers, one third of the drivers in America cannot afford a $600 repair bill without selling something or going into debt. So, I mean, think about that. So if we know that going in, we can play up upon that and, and tie that to not only being audible ready, but, but talking about the, 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 the presentation of and, and protecting 
the family budget, your credit, your investment, your personal savings, and last but not least, maybe even maybe even the vehicle, the vehicle itself. You want to comment on any more of those yet, or how does that sound to you? Well, no, I think it sounds great, and it goes back to the, the former slide that we just had uh, with your, you know, your individual uh, selling and the questions that you were asking earlier. And the the the, the biggest thing is they're going to tell you how to direct that. You know, hey, earlier you mentioned or you told me or you said about the technology. Well, that just ties right into where we're going with this. And it's based on the information they've given you, not something that you're making up. Been a good listener. Been a good listener. Uh, excellent. Next slide, Michael. Ed, you've covered this really well a few minutes ago. Let's just uh, kind of recap that again, the dealership value statement. Uh, th this value statement, I think, really has the opportunity to, to take your game to the next level if you commit yourself to that. It's the, uh, it's, it, it, it's the transition of, of your presentation uh, into, the, uh, in, into the products. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's your dealership DNA, so to speak, and it just uh, sets everything up for you. And this particular one talks about doing business the right way, and the right way that talks about uh, that the, the, the areas of responsibility, respect, honesty, integrity, and trust that your commitment is. Some stores have added another T and that makes uh, transparency and trust. But what I find a lot of stores now doing from a time standpoint, and that I've been, I've been recommending this, and I'm not sure you and I have talked about it before, but yes, just yeah. that deal, just the, the hit principle, the hit principle and make it just three things. Uh, how are you handling that in your store these days? Your store well, today? since you and I have had that discussion, um, I'm transitioning to the uh, the hit principle as well, you know, and it just um, it makes sense, you know. Um, like I said, if, if if anyone hadn't had a chance to go out and listen to uh, Simon Sinek, um, yeah. this is basically what he's talking about, and when he's talking about the why, your beliefs, and we talk about our beliefs and you know being honest and our integrity and transparency. Um, I think that when we explain that to the customer, I think we get their attention you know, as we go through. So when we start presenting our unique financial options and packages, I think that uh, now we have we have an audience. They're, they're paying attention to where we're going with this. I think we're doing that by phone or much earlier on in the digital retail process. But yes, absolutely. At least a part of that, as far as our five commitments of how we do business, and that's our dealership our DNA, which becomes the the foundation of the presentation of our unique of our unique financial financial package. Michael, next slide, sir. Uh, we do this, Ed, with pretty much uh, every workshop that we do, and that's to uh, and, 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 and webinar that we do is to talk about the importance of an organization, whether you're uh, a, a dealer, dealership group, or or, or, or agent, our agent partners, is for your organization uh, have a mission statement and also a, a value statement. This mission statement, I think, probably looks familiar to you because yes. you know the leadership group that I took this from years ago, but yeah. uh, I've never seen one better. But think about this. If our mission statement in the store is very simply, every customer knows what they're getting. Every customer knows what they're getting. They agree to buy it. They know why they need it. And they feel good about it when they leave, leave our dealership. Uh, that's pretty darn good. That's pretty darn good. And will help us with our product sold for retail sale, the repeat and referral business. The customer sees the, uh, the actual product contract and they know exactly what the coverages are. Every customer knows what they're getting and they agree to buy it. They know why they need it and they feel good about it when they when they leave the dealership. How do you feel about that, Ed? Or do you have any others that, that might be better? That you, that you no, I, I think this is spot on. I think that uh, this covers everything. I think that uh, it's spot on. And, you know, when we, when we believe in that, it goes back to the why, our beliefs. If we believe in that, then, you know what, it's going to come across to the consumer. If we don't believe in it, we're just doing it. You know, I always talk about um, compliance or belief. And when I talk about that, I talk about uh, a lot of times we, we get in our cars and a lot of people will put their seatbelt on because they don't want to get a ticket, you know, so that's compliance. Uh, some people put their seatbelts on because they believe that it could save their life. That's belief. Well, you know, when you believe in something, no matter who's around, you're going to do it the right way. If you're just doing it to comply, and I'm saying this, but I don't really believe it in my heart, it's going to come across to the consumer. So when you believe in this uh, mission statement, or the value statement, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. Your customers buy into it a whole lot better. It's a commitment and it, and it shows, is it not? Yes, and absolutely. And that's the repeat and referral business. Then real quickly, our organization, American Guardian Warning Services University, our training value statement that I present in every seminar and webinar that we do, 
every uh, in dealership uh, uh, training that we do in store. Uh, what is it? Uh, we endorse and teach. We endorse and teach the industry standard and best practices that are recommended by NAGA, by AFIP, and, and, and our internal American Guardian group of companies sell our code of conduct for retail sales, which serves as a guide, a guide to the proper sales practices for all retail sellers of AGWS products. And as you know, that NAGA, two other organizations that are, are tied uh, uh, closely to that, is NAMAD, that's the National Association of uh, Minority Auto Dealers, and then also AIAGA, which is the American uh, in, uh, uh, International Automobile Dealers Association, which are the import dealerships in, in America. So again, we endorse and teach the industry standard and best practices that are recommended by NADA, by, by NAMAD, by AIADA, by AFIP, the Association of Finance and Insurance Professionals, as well as our internal seller code of conduct for retail sales, which serves as a guide to the proper sales practices for all retail sellers of our products and services. And our current seller code of conduct for retail sales, we presented it to our agent partners, to our agent partners and dealer clients in June of 17. Uh, the training that we do, they sign off on that. They get a copy of it that goes in their HR personnel file in case we're ever challenged by any state, federal or local regulatory agency. It's 11 bullet, bullet points and guidelines that talks about the presentation of those of, of, of those of those products. How did that sound, Ed, from a training value statement sound? Yeah, I'll take a spot on, Bob. I think that uh, covers everything. Um, and there's, um, I don't think that anyone could misunderstand anything that you just said there. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, next slide, uh, Michael. Michael, this is getting into our webinar schedule. And before we do that, Ed, before Michael wraps this up for us, just want to tell you personally, it's, it's been great to see you again, even though it's on camera this way. It's been some time that we've some time that we've uh, that's been that we've had time to spend together. But uh, I'm just uh, very proud of what you're doing, the opportunity to work with you. I'm sure we'll have some great comments and feedback from what we did today, what you did. And uh, this could be something that we could carry on and maybe a quarterly basis and certainly add, add to that. One of the things that we didn't touch today that you told me earlier that I know you do a lot of is tying in the, the digital, uh, uh, or not the digital retail, but the audible ready solutions into, uh, into not just uh, variable, but, but fixed operations as you're working with, uh, with, with people in, in, in service, uh, the service advisors and managers, whatever. And that would be a great discussion for another, for another, for another, another webinar. Uh, and again, before I re re refer it back to Mike to close it out, uh, anything else you want to add to kind of wrap it up from a standpoint of uh, Audible Ready Solutions? Well, I just want to thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time today. And, and uh, just to let everyone know, I sit in and I listen to uh, and, and, and uh, enjoy the webinar. I've joined a few sessions, as you well know, Bob, and uh, there's a lot of takeaway. So, you know, I think that we all want to continue to grow. Uh, we're never going to stay the same. Either we're going to get better or we're going to go backwards. And so I like to uh, gather all the information. Uh, I don't know how many times a month I pick your brain, Bob, on, on different things and ask questions. So um, we got to stay green. We want to make sure that we continue to grow. And we want to make sure that we're audible ready when we go out and talk to just in life. You know, we want to make sure that whatever we do in life, we're prepared. But especially since this is the business that we've chosen, we want to make sure that we're good at our craft. And we want to make sure that we're prepared and anticipate the events that's going to come. Customers are going to say certain things. We shouldn't be surprised. We should be prepared for it and just change the play a little bit, then get it back on track. So, you know, from sales, F&I, service, it doesn't matter. Uh, as a leader, if you're, if you're a leader, you have a team of people working for you. You got to make sure you're audible ready then as well. Ed, great stuff. Great information. It's certainly been a pleasure to, to see you get and work with you. Likewise. Please say hello to, to Debbie and the family, and I hope everybody is, is doing well. And with that, uh, I want to yield back to, to Mr. Bay. Michael, it's all yours, sir. sir. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ed. Uh, great information, as always. Um, as they've mentioned, uh, take a look at the schedule uh, just so you catch the next webinar. Uh, make sure you uh, like and follow us on LinkedIn. And I uh, thank everybody for joining us today. Um, that's all we got. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, everybody. Have a great wrap up for July as we get into the next quarter. We'll see you all again. Thank you all.